physical media and entertainment from the silver screen to the palm of your hand. What is going on, everybody? Welcome back to From Screen to Shelf podcast, episode three. My name is Will. I am here with Gabe and Chase. We've got a very special episode for everybody today. We're all super excited to uh, present this episode to you guys. We've been waiting for this probably since we, we started the podcast. It's, uh, it's our most anticipated episode that I think we've done yet. Um, we're going to be interviewing the man, the legend, the one and only Jerry the Bus Driver from Texas Chainsaw Massacre himself, Mr. Alan Danziger. Let's, Let's go. go. This movie is, uh, yeah, we're, we're all super excited. This movie has all influenced the three of us, you know, in, in so many ways. And uh, it, it's an honor to be able to interview somebody like Alan, uh, who's, who's, he's synonymous with the horror genre at this point and, and horror fans and for the, for the work that he did in, in Texas Chainsaw Massacre, uh, as well as some of his other projects, which we're, uh, we're going to mm -hmm. ask him about as well. Um, and, and, you know, we, we've heard nothing about great things about him from Chase, who had the opportunity to meet him. Um, he's seems to just a super gracious and super humble guy. And, uh, we thought, you know, what better way to uh, to conduct our first interview than with somebody like Alan, who is just, you know, just a joy to uh, to talk to. Um, Chase, I don't know if you want to say anything. You've had the chance to meet Alan uh, a few few times, so I don't know if you want to go on about that or just kind of give everybody a an introduction uh, on a more personal note, so to speak. Yeah, I got to meet him. I want to say it was about a month ago at this point um at the alamo draft house up here where i live and it was a film reel screening where he and mr dugan with a very special guest appearance from miss caroline williams nobody was expecting that um showed up and did a q a we do some little breaks in between and he would just give some goofy takes um like you know make everybody laugh and stuff like that and he kept the joy alive same with mr dugan and of course miss williams as well um, it just really made me connect on a whole different level with the Texas Chainsaw movie because seeing the way that he has such enthusiasm for the fans, you know, I, I want to say maybe 35, 40 people were there, which I, I would consider that relatively small. Um, I think I've talked to you guys one-on-one -on, -one on that kind of basis, but yeah. everybody was just kind of staggered that there were so many people there. And I was like, oh, okay. I feel like this is a pretty healthy amount of people. Um, but they were just overwhelmed with the amount of people that showed up. And it was genuinely awesome. And then they invited me to go to the Colorado Festival of Horror, where he, uh, him, Mr. Dugan, and Miss Williams were the the main draw there, um, doing more Q and A's and stuff like that. This was kind of a preface to the event. And the day that I did manage to show up, I got to have a lot of one on one time with Mr. Danziger, and I got to ask him a lot of things. I remember whenever I showed him my second sight Texas Chainsaw um, 4K. He was just super curious. He's like, why is this so big? And I was like, oh, look at all of this, you know, just getting so excited, showing him it. And then same with Mr. Dugan, uh, got to show him that. And they both really, really loved the, um, I forget the exact name, but the little um, cards that come into the set. Mm -hmm. uh, they just got very, very overjoyed seeing the eye shot of Marilyn Burns, which is a very sentimental thing to them, uh, especially with the passing. Unfortunately, uh, Miss Burns is no longer with us. Rest in peace. And those are things that they very, very much so connect with. And so I got to spend a lot of time with him and I feel like I built, I built some good rapport with him and that leads us to our very special episode today. We're excited guys. So sit back, enjoy, uh, as we, uh, interview the great Alan Danziger. All right, ladies and gentlemen, listeners out there, it's that time. We're here with a very special guest. We're extremely excited to uh, to introduce this guy here. He's known for Eggshells, Storage Locker, Cannibal Comedian, some of his newer movies. Most notably, The Legend, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and the upcoming Weed Hacker Massacre. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Alan Danziger. Welcome, Alan. Well, great to be here. And uh, where are we? Where are we speaking from? You are you guys? You're in Denver. Am I talking to people in Denver? Uh, no, we're I'm all over the, the place, Coast. sir. Yeah, I'm I'm in Rhode oh. Island, uh, and uh, Gabe is in Vegas, Las Vegas, and Chase is uh, coming out. Of, he's broadcasting out of Denver. Yep, you got it. Oh, terrific. Hey, okay, let's get 
let's get busy. Let's get started. <laughs> let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Well, Mr. Uh, Mr. Danziger, the, the first question I had for you, sir, um, was something that kind of appealed to me because I'm actually a licensed clinician and I noticed that you had graduated with two master's degrees. Uh, one in so uh, I think social psychology and one was in social work, if that's correct. Right. And actually, I did social work for about 10 years before I, I started my own inter entertainment company. And it was doing social work. And as a result of doing social work, I got to meet at the time David and Amy Spa. And uh, they were and that was Toby's first movie was about this couple and the um I don't know, ghosts or just crazy stuff that was happening in their house. And one of the scenes was they were doing volunteer work with me. I was working with uh, welfare folks in East Austin. And then they came to my house and Toby Hooper, who, as you know, the legend uh, mm -hmm. directed uh, Chainsaw, he, he said, Alan, uh, can we film a, a scene with you? And at the time, my wife and my son was like eight months old. And so they came to my house and filmed the scene with us and I guess they liked it or they thought I was funny and, and they kept adding scenes for me to be in uh in eggshells and eggshells is what I would call cinema verite which means there are no lines you know mm -hmm. it's just it, it's just happening as it's happening mm -hmm. and uh eventually I mean the movie came out and I think about 30 people saw that movie <laughs> you know so it, it got into legal entanglement and now I just found out that it's on YouTube. So um, I was watching it this morning and there's a scene where uh, 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 Tim Hinkle, who wrote Chainsaw along with, with Toby, starts reading a poem to me. And then I look at him and, and I say, are you talking to me? <laughs> and uh, I, that was in 1969 and, and Taxi Driver didn't come out till 76. So I Oh, really? Oh my! Yes, if Scorsese saw that movie and <laughs> took my life. <laughs> we need to get Scorsese on the podcast and and just be forthcoming yeah. with him and ask him, right? <laughs> right, and gave it to Rob De Niro. And now there's a book, and the title of the book is "You Talking to Me," and and it's by a fellow by the name of uh, uh, what's his Brian Abrams. I'm going to get that book and find out what that what that line where that line came from if he knows. <laughs> <laughs> that's you know, so interesting yeah yeah oh man so we gotta me. work on that we gotta work on getting you royalties for a uh, taxi driver <laughs> exactly you know i don't i don't want to be on the corner we'll work for food or i don't want to have to fight for beef food stamps at this time <laughs> <laughs> well how, how was that out of curiosity because you said you you had done 10 years of experience in social work and then all of a sudden you're kind of like thrown into the film world, so to speak, what did did you have aspirations towards film, or were you just kind of geared no. towards staying in social work at that time? No, I was just doing social work and uh, and enjoying that. You know, I guess you know helping people was just something I I liked, and you know if I could make a difference in the community, it, mm -hmm. that that was that was it. But but you know when eggshells came out and like nobody saw it, you know, <laughs> so like four years you know goes by and. And then all of a sudden I got a call from, uh, I'm not sure if it was from Toby or from Kim. And they said, Alan, we, we wrote this movie and, and we have a part that we'd like you to play. So it wasn't like I had to audition for it. They wrote the part and they, I guess, I hope they had me in mind. And so I, I took the script home and I mean, I read it and it was just mesmerizing. And so after reading the script, I said, you know, I'll be, I'll do it. Don't tell anybody in, in my social realm you know that i'm doing this movie because it was just too much conflict you know it was about a group of crazy crazy people killing people and <laughs> like, and there's a little there about some cannibalism that's now out front in this new movie cannibal comedian so i haven't seen the movie but you know i did the uh, the narration the voiceover which yeah. was an homage you know john larroquette who did the uh the opening dialogue a voiceover in Chainsaw. So it's just, it's funny and crazy at the same time. That, that's an awesome transition. And uh, I, I mean, kudos to you for taking that leap of faith, man. 
because <laughs> like you said kind of going from social work and then kind of you know it, it does conflict because you're doing all this stuff to kind of you know work for the community and remain as professional as possible but then you're taking these very intriguing interesting projects <laughs> that people would maybe t- you know, take a second eye at and i didn't tell anybody that i was doing this or that i was even in this movie you know for years until you know somehow it came out and i, I had no choice but uh <laughs> But when we shot the movie, they were real. They worked around my schedule because I was doing a camp for for uh, kids with you know uh, mental disabilities, and okay. so my availability was like I think on the weekends. And so they worked around me, and uh, they took me to the set in this like old uh, kind of like a, a Winnebago. And one of the highlights of that was I got to meet John Henry Falk, who was mm. an incredible. A uh, person, a raconteur. I think he was blacklisted, and just being on, you know, just driving out to the set and just listening to this guy was just something, you know, it was spectacular to me. I really, I really love this guy. Oh, that's awesome! And and thank you for for opening up about that because I yeah I'd read about your your educational background and I was like I'm intrigued. I kind of want to ask him how you know you kind of went from social work to you know all this kind of horror genre. <laughs> film stuff and it sounds like you just kind of took that leap with it which is fr- uh, freaking amazing um i know i think uh, chase you had some questions about eggshells didn't you that you wanted yeah. to go off of yeah i know it uh might be going uh, a bit back because there was a i believe it was a five-year gap between eggshells and texas chainsaw um but those are two completely different projects the way that i like to kind of describe eggshells is the psychedelic aspects of 2001 a space odyssey and in lieu of like the the acid trip era of movies of that time but in an attic <laughs> you know um it, it's it's a wonderful movie so i was just curious like with that being your first film um and the way that it was shot what was your biggest takeaway going from that to texas chainsaw uh because Obviously, you were eager to work with Tobe again, you know, Mr. Hooper himself. Um, what captivated you so much about Eggshells that got you so excited about that project to be on board? Well, I mean, you know, it, it, it was so uh, out of the, just out of my realm. I mean, my realm was, you know, was social work. I mean, my mom, you know, when I left, I, I went to City College. I actually went to the Bronx High School of Science. And I don't know if you'll know this, but my best friend, in high school was Stokely Carmichael, who was the originator of the Black Power movement. Oh, wow. They, wow. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's just, and actually he was the first fellow that I met uh, before we even went to school. He came to my house and told me he was going to science. And I said, I'm going also. And, you know, we became really good friends throughout the, our years in high school. But anyway, I then went to City College and, uh, you know, I just knew that I, I needed to get away from home if I was going to grow up. My mom was a pretty domineering lady. And somebody <laughs> saw me at the, at the library at City College. It was a rainy, gloomy day. And he said, Alan, why so gloom? Why so gloomy? And I, and I said, I just don't know what I want to do with my life. And uh, I had done pretty good in, in uh, psychology at, at UT. And he said, well, why not go to the University of Texas? I said, what? He said, yeah, go to Texas. I said, I don't know how to ride a horse. I've never been in a posse. (laughs) That's going to work for me. But he said, it's not that hard to get in. And I think you'd enjoy it. And so that's how I ended up in in uh, in Austin. And uh, I mean, my folks were laughing all the way to the airport, never thinking that I'd get on the plane, you know, and and, uh, but I came to Austin and I loved it. I mean, back then. And the city, everything was like 10 minutes away. There was no traffic. Uh, it was just a beautiful little city. I still love it, but it's, it's a lot different. But that, that's a little bit of a segue. But anyway, that's how I, uh, I forget even what your question was right now. <laughs> no, you pretty much answered it because uh, uh, Tobe Hooper is an Austin legend. Uh, I grew up in Dallas myself. Um, people love Tobe Hooper as a, as a Texas native. You know, uh, what he's done for the state, brought filmography there and stuff like that. And especially at that time. And, thing, yeah. and I and I met Toby in, in a social setting. In fact, the couple that were living downstairs from us was Sally Richardson. And at the time of what was Jim Schulman, who's actually plays the music in, in Eggshells. And so oh, by wow. meeting oh. yeah, Sally, who was just a wonderful, they were just wonderful people. 
In fact, I got the first time I went to Colorado was to to stay with uh, with Jim and Sally over Thanksgiving many many years ago. But anyway, so I I met Toby in a in a social setting, and so that's I think how when David and Amy be, uh, became volunteers with my program, they ended up coming to my house at the time, and uh, and, and that you know shooting a scene and then shooting another scene. In fact, there's a scene at the have you guys seen eggshells? Oh, of course. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, there's that wedding scene, and and the rabbi that married David and Amy was the same uh, rabbi that married myself and and my wife at the time, Sharon. Aww. And so, oh, that's cool. And and and, and this guy, uh, I, Mickey Sills, he just was a a, a wonderful guy, good, you know, handsome guy, and uh, he just had great so He just had a charisma about him, and. Through him, I actually met many years ago Kinky Friedman, who, uh, I mean, came to my house when he said he was going to go to Nashville and become a Jewish country western singer, you know. And wow. I laughed at the time, but he, <laughs> he ended up doing it. And uh, he actually wrote a song about uh, Charles Whitman, who was, shoot was shooting, uh, you know, people on the, from the tower. Uh, yeah. Was, oh, yeah. Guess, and and the funny thing is, I was driving down that street. I was driving down Guadalupe on a motor scooter when he was shooting people, and a cop started screaming at me to get off the road, you know, get off the street. Oh. So, oh wow, yeah. wow, yeah, yeah. If it's not your time, it's not your time, you know. Just yeah. If I had happened, I wouldn't have been in, in chainsaw for sure. <laughs> Well, we're Definitely. thankful that you were, and yeah. I mean, kind of yeah. transitioning to Chainsaw, um, I, I had a question that popped in my head last night. Um, w when you first got the part for Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you re you read the screenplay. Do you remember your, what your right. first initial thoughts are after reading and finishing the last page? I said, you know, this is crazy. I mean, I didn't, <laughs> I, honestly, I didn't know what to think of it. I hadn't read screenplays, you know, I hadn't taken any acting classes. It was, mm. it was just all like surreal for me. And, uh, but, you know, when I came to the, to the meeting and, and I met everybody, you know, it was just, it was just kind of like a fun thing to do. And, you know, they offered me, they offered me, I mean, at the time, anything, I would have done it probably for a cheeseburger, you know, but they, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, they had me write, I uh, mean, sign a, uh, they call it uh, a contract, mm -hmm. and and the con it was you know very little money, but because it was they offered me you know a percentage of the movie should it be a hit, and uh, and as it turns out the movie was a hit, but unfortunately mm. the distributors were the mafia, you yep. know so mm, no. the the movie sitting up you know up the charts I'm I'm following it in variety, and I thought I think I hit the brass ring. You know, I can't believe it, but I may be able to retire unbeknownst all the money. And this movie made a lot of money. You know, the, the first wave went to the went to the mafia. And that's yep. where the real matter, is, I think, with the mafia. But anyway, wow. years later, they wow. got the movie back. And, you know, and, and all of us that had, you know, we do get some, you know, some money. So after 50 years that we're still getting, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for, for everything that's happened really been something yeah it's been quite a journey and and uh, did, a follow-up question to that what was jerry the character like you had in mind or did they already assign you jerry like when you were reading the screenplay yeah. or did you not know no 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 they said this is you this is you <laughs> <laughs> you're the bus driver <laughs> yeah, yeah driver i'm the van driver you know and, and the van that i drove was a 70 was a 72 van and it belonged to uh, the sound guy, Ted Nikolai. And so, I mean, I mean, there was no budget for this movie. It was, it was very, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's just crazy. I mean, I'm actually driving and saying my lines and most of those lines, a lot of the funny lines that are in it are my own lines. Cause they said, Alan, just, you know, make it up, just be you. Oh, wow. And, wow. Yeah. 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 You know, the, the quit goofing on me and, you know that uh, as I go into that into the uh, gas station, I say, "Does this place have ga have room service?" Those are my lines, you know. So, and it worked. <laughs> that is awesome. So, it it totally yeah. worked. <laughs> yeah, I mean, originally I 
that movie was supposed to be more of a spoof on horror movies. But when they, I guess in the editing and whatnot, they said, Jesus, there's a lot of good horror here. And so that they played that part up, but they kept a lot of the fun stuff and or the funny lines, you know, that are in there, you know, the dark humor. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> I mean, and same with Jim Cedow, you know, I, I take no pleasure in killing, but some things you got to do, you know, I mean, it's hilarious. <laughs> And and uh, I'm going to lead it to Chase here in a second because I know he has some more, some more questions. But um, in the Shocking Truth documentary, uh, you had said that you were terrified of of Leatherface. Um, well, yeah, how, how many? Reason, oh, go ahead. I was going to say the reason I, I I was is because I hadn't seen I hadn't seen Leatherface. I didn't stay on the set. You know, I didn't hang out because I had to camp. You know, to take care oh, of. Oh yeah. So, so the way that worked is I said, let me. Let me just sit on the on the uh, on the porch before I go in blind and and blindfold me. So, what what takes place will be my first reaction to seeing you know Leatherface as the scene you know progresses. So I sat out on the porch blindfolded and I was really what I call my nod to the Stanislavski method. Not that I know anything <laughs> about that, but I know the name. So, uh, so I they you know I'm blindfolded you know they. They yell, they say, okay, action. I'm walking through the, you know, through the, you know, the house, through the vestibule, into the kitchen, you know, the, the, uh, the freezer. So I see the, I see uh, the hook and then the freezer starts. I open up the freezer. She pops out. I freak and I started <laughs> screaming before uh, Leatherface is even in the scene with the hammer, you know, the, and so I go screaming out of the house and, you know, Toby yells, cut, puts his arm around me, said, that's a great screen, screen, but you, you got to wait for him to come into the picture, you know, with, with the hammer. <laughs> so he, he wasn't even in the frame yet. Yeah. No, no, but I just saw him just coming in through the kitchen and I'm freaking. And uh, so I think we had to shoot it probably three times. By the third time, the guy, I had guys behind me, the grips. I uh, had their fingers in my belt loops, and so they pulled me down. <laughs> this is the and and you know, I took that shot like you know fifty years ago, and I'm still getting headaches. You know, <laughs> so that was a pretty, it was a pretty. <laughs> oh man! And what I I know Chase had a question about Leatherface actually. No, yeah, it was a uh, more or less like whenever you first saw him, like, especially since it was more or less a silhouette that you saw a frame of Leatherface himself, was it the the sheer size of Mr. Hansen? Um, was it the mask, yeah, the first time seeing that? Yeah, it was, it was everything. I mean, the sheer, I mean, he was a big guy and they also yeah. had like boots and I'm more of a munchkin. So, I mean, it was like <laughs> this mountain, you know, this mountain of a guy coming in, you know, to do damage to me. So yeah, no, I, I freaked several times. In fact, I think I've, I've voted number eight in all time screams when the character didn't know what was going to happen to him. <laughs> I love that. That is so great. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's yeah. things like that behind the scenes that I absolutely love hearing that make every scene more genuine, especially when it comes to Texas Chainsaw itself. It's just every, everybody seems so genuine. Everybody like loved being there um more or less right i mean we've seen the shocking truth documentary and stuff like that it just seemed like a lot of people had a great time um no, and that's not so i mean the the scene where the um in the kitchen you know where they're sitting around dinner mm -hmm. you know and marilyn's up and before they you know they bring down grandpa that was that was immensely that was a terrible that was a terrible shoot i mean it went on you hear 17 hours, 22 hours, 20, and, and, and the food was, was, uh, was, uh, reeking. I mean, it was rank. Leatherface had worn this costume, you know, for three weeks. You didn't want to be around the guy, you know? So, I mean, <laughs> that, that was not fun. I mean, I had the best time because I, I wasn't involved in that. You know, the only time I was in that house was, was to get killed. You know what I mean? So I didn't have to smell them. You know, I mean, I don't think I, Stacks or any of that stuff would have would have taken the smell away from that what was going on there. Oh man. <laughs> no, I absolutely <laughs> love that. It's um yeah, it's uh it definitely had some some conditions to work in for sure, you know, maybe a little bit hazardous <laughs> to a degree had you been there a little bit longer. 
Um, glad you got in and out while you could, for sure. You know, <laughs> glad you're with us. Uh, yeah, and the, and the thing is, when we were shooting, uh, you know, the scenes on on the different highways, uh, it was like 110 degrees in that van. There was no AC. Oh it was my. Blocked, you know, oh God. The windows are up. I mean, Toby's in there. I don't know if he was smoking a cigar at the time, but the the lights and whatnot. I mean, it, it was brutal. So after, I guess after every few after every few takes, the girls would go into the uh, makeup trailer, and Dottie, you know, would fix them up and you know do their hair or whatever. Uh, and and I'm watching this, and after a few, you know, an, an hour or two, I said, "Gee, they're they're getting to go into air conditioning and and cool off." So. I thought, well, maybe I can I can do the same. And so after one of those uh, takes, I snuck out of the out of the van and I went into the makeup trailer. No sooner did I sit down, they came running over and they said, "Alan, there's nothing we can do for you. You got to get out of here." <laughs> so that was, that was <laughs> oh my god. That, for me, nothing they could do for me would help me. Well, you did a fantastic job considering the circumstances, because every time I saw the film, I'm like, man, Jerry is just so chill. And I know it's hot in that van and I know it's crowded in that van. And you were just always so chill. (laughs) Well, yeah, I mean, you see me, you know, when we were at the gas station, that's another that was one of my best, the best one of the fun scenes that we did, as you know, you know, and then uh, Jim C. Dow comes out and and, you know, he says they got no gas. And mm-hmm. we're 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 incredulous. What do you mean you got no gas? <laughs> well, w- w- one of those one of those takes when he's coming to the van, I and I told this before, but I inadvertently hit the uh, the windshield wiper, and that it sprayed all this soapy water <laughs> on Jim seat out, <laughs> and he, he's trying to deliver his line with all the soapy water coming down, <laughs> and so uh, Bill. Bill and myself i mean we lost it you know we just couldn't we started laughing and take after take after take it just didn't work we were cracking up so much so that toby actually walked off the set and i think uh kim hinkle had to finish it up we we were oh, gone wow. for the day oh wow yeah <laughs> oh, i don't man. know if it, i i it made the, one of the blooper reels you know what i mean it it I think something, but you don't see the uh, that I that I can think of the blooper reel where all this soapy water is is coming down. Uh, Jim C. Now say that's a classic. That's that's worth a movie right there. Oh, now I have to rewatch that scene. <laughs> I need to fast forward just to yeah. that scene. This <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, with the troll coming over and he puts the soapy water, you know, on the windshield. That's when I inadvertently hit the windshield wiper. Boom. All over Jim C. Dow's face. And he's trying to deliver his lines as a true pro. He was a professional. <laughs> that, that is awesome. Amazing. I absolutely love that. Yeah. Will, do you have any questions about any of that? Uh, I was actually curious because um, you mentioned that prior to the release or when filming and, and so on and after the release, you didn't tell many people about your involvement uh, with that project. Um but obviously they found out later on. What were those reactions like? I mean, were they supportive? Were there, were people kind of questioning that? I'm just curious as to 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 no, from, no, you know, family no, and friends I, what that was like. Yeah, it was it was. Um, I mean, it was many years later, and and uh, although you know when when the movie came out, this was in '74. Mm. My parents were had retired, and they moved to Florida, and and. And my parents, I think, actually saw eggshells. I think they were one of the 30 people that saw that movie. <laughs> but they ended up going with an aunt and uncle uh, to uh, to see Chainsaw. And unfortunately, it was playing in a porno theater. Oh, at, at my God. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was a double feature. And the second feature was Debbie Does Dialysis. <laughs> oh, oh, my, my God. God. <laughs> Well, yeah, because I know at the time, a lot of the Grindhouse films and, you know, Texas Chainsaw at the time was considered one of those movies. I I remember reading about this before where they would just throw those movies in with porno movies like the right. 42nd Street right. type films and, and films yeah. of that yeah. films like that. Wow. And I think that and, and, the, scene, I, and the scene where I, I'm going into that, you know, to get killed, my mother starts screaming for me not to go into that house <laughs> in her name, which which was no language. My mother spoke no language. She just grunted a lot. But they called me after they saw the movie to make sure I was still alive. You know, so 
That was kind of sweet. <laughs> it's apparently instinct kicking in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh, I, 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 I tried. Yeah, I tried to think my parents. I mean, my mom, I think, actually wanted to become, a, you know, a doctor or, or a lawyer or a dentist. And I came close. I became a patient. <laughs> that's we we never expect that uh, to turn yeah. out that way but sometimes it does no, we, yeah <laughs> and so like i mean it, it comes out and and uh, so people were supportive for the most part i know you talked about your parents a little bit but how about yeah. everybody else as yeah. soon as it comes out and they they actually see it and it's a it's a i mean it's pretty shocking for you know the early 70s like we haven't really seen anything like like that even though i know a lot of the violence kind of happens off screen so to speak but it's it's still a pretty gruesome movie were were people shocked were they supportive How, like what was their overall reaction at least people in your personal yeah, circles mean, in my personal circle they you know very you know very supportive you know what i mean they they got a kick out of you know seeing me and and actually when when the the premiere of the movie actually a friend rented a limousine for me you know and, uh, and so it was this, this, I, I was as I refer to myself, it was like a poor man's. I was like a Kmart discount star at the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man! But at no, least everyone so, was supportive of it. That that's pretty cool. Yeah, like it, yeah, it didn't yeah. it didn't scare your friends away at all. <laughs> no, no, no. I can't think of. Uh, if they did, they were no longer my friends. You know, so I didn't worry about it. <laughs> but, but but the thing is, you know, when the movie came out, I, yeah, I forgot to. Tell, and I actually went to see the coming attraction. It was on Anderson Lane. It was, at the time, was the, it was called the Village Four. It's now the Alamo Draft House. Yeah, oh, wow. I'm familiar right. with that. Yes. Yeah, and I went in and, and saw the coming attractions. And when I saw myself on the screen, I ran out of the theater. I was just, I don't <laughs> know, just seeing yourself on that screen like that. I was all freaked out. And then, <laughs> stupidly, I take my son, who's like about to see the oh, coming, just to see his oh man just to see his head on you know in the coming attraction and that's 50 years ago he's still in weekly therapy so there's <laughs> i mean <laughs> oh man did he did he make it through the whole movie or did you guys like walk yeah. out halfway through or what <laughs> you know i don't think he still has seen the movie you oh, know wow. or or my, my kids are like 19 and 17 i don't think they've seen the movie either they have nothing to do with it wow. they want nothing to do with that that part you know so it's 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 not fair you know but but the fans that we meet and now i mean i'm meeting kids that are you know eight or nine that have seen the movie several times you know uh it's just a, a new fan base and and truthfully there's very little blood in the original mm. it, yeah you know the mm -hmm. it's just it's it's wide and and I think that's what's so great about this movie. Uh, and and in fact, I mean, Quentin Tarantino called it a perfect movie. Mm. It's it's just a confluence of things you would never dream of, and and it was just like they caught lightning in a bottle in the, with this movie. It's I believable. The, yeah, I, I was like going to say. Oh, go ahead, Alan. Sorry. No, no, no. I was just saying there's just something about it, the grittiness of it, and and yet it's filmed beautifully. Daniel Pearl. I mean, did a masterful job. Everybody, everybody was great in this movie. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because Texas Chainsaw Massacre, it's always been advertised as one of the most violent films ever made. But I think it's a testament to the to Toby's direction style, but the, also the power of suggestion, right? And it, it's not actually that violent. Exactly. It's just, it, it's one of those movies no. where it, it just kind of, your mind kind of takes you to those places, right? And and it's the implied violence that that that's so effective about it. And and then you know I don't know I think it may have been that you know we didn't I didn't pal around with any uh, you know with uh, with Ed Neal at the time or with with Gunner I mean it's almost like we were kept apart and I think that just added to the uh, to the intensity you know of 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 what took place on once the movie was over I met uh, 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 Gunner and I became very good friends in fact he spent the summer with me stayed with me before he moved to Maine and wow, cool. and then later on. I got to meet uh, Paul Partain after the movie, and he turned out to be the nicest, sweetest guy. But, but I hated him while we were making the movie. You know, we all yeah. wanted him to die. You know, <laughs> so, you know how does that? You know, when you want a guy in a wheelchair to die, that's pretty. 
You know, that's that's almost like a wood mark, you know, type of thing. <laughs> So, Mr. Allen, I have a question. I'm sure you get asked this, but which of the sequels have you seen? I've seen several. Uh, I, I, saw, I, I think I like the one with Jessica Biel. Okay. I like the one, mm-hmm. the, the 3D movie, because, you know, 3D. And, and the interesting thing is they use clips of the original movie in the 3D at the opening sequence. And I got more money for not being in the movie than I got for mm-hmm. being in the movie. <laughs> wow. <laughs> That's a little side thing there. And then um, uh, Alexandra Tadari, I mean, she's gorgeous, you know, so I I enjoyed that. And uh, I'm trying to think, I think the the one with Matthew McConaughey, who I like, and uh, Renee Zell, but that to me was, you know, just way over the top. I saw the Netflix movie and I was at the premiere and I met the, the director, David Blue Garcia, really nice guy. And I enjoyed that, you know, for the kills and some of the stuff. But, you know, I, I think it got a lot of negative stuff. It was, I mean, filmed them in Bulgaria, but you got to do what you got to do. But yeah. but some of the kills were, well, you know, pretty good. So I haven't seen all of them, but I've seen most of them. And some of them, you know, I I kind of like. And But they all compare it to the original. And the original seems to still be the one that everybody looks to. So I feel good about that. And. You know, and and just how gracious, I mean, and grateful I am, you know, to the fans of the original Chainsaw. Yeah. And I'm actually really happy that you said that you got to see the Netflix Chainsaw movie, um, because recently we've been seeing a lot of like recently with Exorcist, we've been seeing some um, direct sequels and stuff along those lines. And so since you've seen it, I wanted to pose a question to you in regards to legacy characters. And whenever it comes to um, the way that Marilyn Burns Sally was handled in um, coming back at the towards the tail end of the Netflix Chainsaw Massacre movie, whenever you yeah, first watched that, like, how, okay, <laughs> I didn't. No, I didn't think she was treated, you know, uh, treated well in that they they should have done a better job yeah. in how she was treated. So, mm. but you know that I don't know you know. That wasn't my, that wouldn't have been my choice, you sure. know, and uh, I mean, she was the first final girl. And I mean, what she went through in making of, of Chainsaw, I mean, she gave it, a, she gave it her all. I mean, she was a wreck when the movie was over. And, mm. Uh, mm. and she too was sweetest, she's a wonderful lady and, you know, gone too soon. You know, Gunner gone, you know, gone too soon. I mean, uh, Paul gone too, you know, it just, it, it's so sad that, like I say, we're a vanishing breed. So I tell people you need to get us while I'm still vertical and, you know, and not drooling. <laughs> yes, sir. Or in, or in diapers for that matter, you know. <laughs> it's, I, if I knew I was going to live this long as Mickey Mantle's one, I would have taken better care of myself. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> hey, and Will, you actually had an amazing question we were talking about earlier. Um, if you want to go ahead, I think that'd be a perfect opportunity to go ahead and ask him that. Yeah, Alan, I, I I was curious about this. I know after the release of Texas Chainsaw, you you took some time off um, from from movies and acting. But I was curious: was there ever a project outside of the horror genre? You probably get a lot of questions about horror, so I figured I'd ask you something uh, outside of that world. Was there ever a project outside of the genre that you were either approached about doing, or or something that you were ever interested in that that you would have liked to have yeah, been a part of? Yeah. Well, after that, I mean, I think I went from the top I, to be, I was an extra in, in Willie Nelson's Honeysuckle Rose. I think I was in, a, in the, you know, a, a, in the opening montage. I think you see the back of my shirt. So <laughs> I, and I did it. And, and then I was approached by Eagle Pinnell, who was an up and coming director uh, to do, he was going to do like four vignettes of, of, of young couples. And he asked if I would do one. And I was in the middle of shooting it when I, I had to leave to, for an S training. I won't go into that. I won't go into that at all. But that was something oh, that man. was big back, back in, this, in, the, in, the, in the 70s. And, and then when I came back, because of money or whatever, they decided to go with a, a, just a vignette about, uh, I think it ended up being called The Last Night at the Alamo. And it's and they really I think won awards and uh, oh. so I you know 
that vignette. I don't know what ever happened to the, the film of that. And I think I was in a, a, another movie that didn't make it to the screen. I think it was called The Tomato That Ate Austin or something like that. So it was just a Love couple. That title. And then, yeah. But, you know, like I say, my background was social work. So I continued yeah. to do that. And then, and then I, I started with two other guys of the uh, my entertainment company called the three ring service and i did that for about 30 years and then you know in uh 2004 you know gunner came to me and said hey alan we're they they want to do a uh, a reunion of cast members for for chainsaw i didn't even know what he was talking about mm. but he, he, i would do it and i said yeah why not and so that that's my first uh horror con was in 2004 at cinema wasteland and and i honestly thought i'd be meeting serial killers i mean wannabes <laughs> anyway and, wannabes yeah you know I mean? and it turned out these were the nicest people you could ever meet and they were so so wonderful to me i guess they saw me as fresh meat you know but uh <laughs> it, it, it was it, it was eye-opening to to see how people you know Loved this movie, and at that first con was, uh, I mean, Paul was there, and and Ed Neal was there, and Bob Burns, who was also a genius, and a lot of the props and the look of that movie is due to to Bob Burns, who also, you know, died way too young. So mm -hmm. I don't know, you know, it's kind of uh, going down memory lane. It's kind of sad at the same time that a lot of these folks aren't around, you know, to yeah. see the appreciation like you guys have for us you know that were you know that started this kind of genre you know what i mean it just uh in texas of all places well they'll be sorely missed and uh, to, to add to that point i think you, you mentioned you know how welcoming everybody was chase and i and gabe we've talked about this as well about the horror community it, it's different horror fans are different from from fans of other genres in the aspect that for some reason that community it, it's it's so close uh, and there's so much respect and, and adoration for for these movies. You're totally um, right. Yeah. Chainsaw fans, you know, I think that and we did a, uh, I think it might have been in Cinema Way, a, a reunion. And I said, I mean, chain, I mean, horror fans are great, but Chainsaw fans are the bomb. Yeah. They're the best. <laughs> yeah. I still have my you dad's know? VHS um, that I found. I, God, it's been so many years now, but it's 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 still intact, you know, and, and in good condition. I watch it time to time, and obviously, we all we talk about your movie constantly, you know, um, in our community, um, and we're just, you know, we're so appreciative of it. It's helped. It's made us who we are today, you know. Yeah, and I and uh, I mean, the thing is, at the, at this age, at you know, of being eight, I'm 81 now, and my my biggest fear about growing old other than having a prostate the size of a volleyball was that I would end up living, you know, down, down by the river feeding ducks. And, uh, but I got the van, I actually got a replica van of, of what I, what I drove in the movie. I drove a 72 Ford van and I found on a website on a, on a fan chainsaw fan website, the same van that I drove only it was two years newer. It's a 74. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's cool. And and it was and and there was a phone number on it, and I called the number, and the fellow that answered this is it, this is a fun you know aside. The guy's name is Scott Key, and I as an opening line I said Scott, are are you by any chance related to Francis Scott Key who wrote the Star Spangled Banner? And he said, as a matter of fact, I am. He was his great 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 uncle. Oh wow! So uh, wow. Yeah yeah. So that be a way, and I said. I, I said, I'm sure you don't have it anymore. But he said, no, I do have a van. It's been on block, you know, up on blocks for about 20 some odd years and it doesn't have a gas tank. But I said, well, I was the OG, you know, I drove it. <laughs> uh, yeah. I said, I, I got to get it. And it was, it didn't seem unreasonable. And I think it was going to be quite a bit to, to drive it down, to get it down here. And he said he would bring it down. So we we struck you know we struck the right price and and he brought it down he trailered it down I I took it to my mechanic and I you know I didn't know anything about fixing fixing the van but my mechanic set me straight and he said it's more than just changing out the gas tank it needed everything and yeah. and he did it and then I took it to another guy that, that did the interior so gosh 
I guess I probably spent close to 30,000 putting this van together. But, oh, wow. And then, oh, wow. And then the first paint job that we did wasn't right, and the fan got me the right color. So it's been restored, and actually I'm taking it uh, for uh, the first time uh, here in uh, in about two weeks. I'll be in Houston at uh, Lone Star Comics, and I'm going to have the van there along with uh, some other surprises. I even have Franklin is going to be there, and I have an animatronic oh, wow. leather face. And myself oh, and then John Duke. Oh, man. It's going to be a first. It's going to be something special, really. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, man. And, I mean, we we appreciate you always. I mean, like, like all these cons that happen, you're always there. You're always so interactive with fans. And, I mean, we, we appreciate, you know, you reciprocating that to us because, I mean, Texas Chainsaw is just a staple of a movie. And, like, you, you've just been so open in terms of, you know, uh, answering questions about the movie and, you know, talking to fans about your experiences with it. It's something that we appreciate as well. Um, and well, I think that, I oh, mean, go ahead. Yeah, a lot of um, have become, you know, film, I mean, I can't tell you how many people said, Alan, we we became filmmakers because of this movie. It's unbelievable. Mm -hmm. It really is. It's super inspiring. And, and I know. And then, uh, and then when I was in Denver, that said, you know, that first night, Thursday night, I mean, it was, I think it was it was raining and yet it was like standing yep. room only at that at that little at the Alamo, at the Alamo. Grand House in Denver. Yeah, because that's where yeah. we met. And I wanted to extend a heartfelt thank you for the atmosphere that you provided, you, Miss Caroline, um, the horrible fan, uh, horrible horrible cinema fan club, the Colorado Festival of Horror for throwing such a memory. I'll never forget that night. Um, everybody there, Mr. Dugan as well. Like you guys threw something really special for people like myself. You know um taking the time at the end to let me just thank you and then i got to see you a couple of days later and talk to you for a little while um it's memories like those and that people cherish forever you know people are going to think about it 20 30 years later just the same way that you have the memories from filming chainsaw eggshells and then cannibal comedian and the storage locker all those memories that you make you never know 30 years in the future just like you were saying you have eight nine year old kids that have seen the movie multiple times <laughs> over that just have adoration for you the whole crew and everything so a heartfelt thank you for everything that you've done for the community and the memories and you provided it's it's reciprocated you know i'm, I'm just saying i get so much energy from, you know, from meeting the fans and, and they're just so genuine. You know what I mean? They really, you can see it. They just really love this movie. I mean, I'm, I see a whole uh, uh, panoply of, of uh, tattoos with leather face, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah. that's, some stuff, you know, that's some very serious stuff <laughs> when you got tattoos. And um, just to kind of shift into um, uh, kind of like more current stuff. Um, I know I, we we kind of wanted to ask you about the current horror landscape right now, and then also uh, we wanted to get into uh, Weed Hacker Massacre. But um, kind of just to piggyback what Will was asking in terms of like the horror landscape right now and all these movies bringing back legacy characters. I mean, wh what what has been like your thoughts and your experience kind of transitioning to, you know, where we're at right now, 2023 horror? How have you been perceiving like all these sequels and return of legacy characters? Like, how has it resonated with you? To be honest with you, because I never really was a true fan, you know, of, of that genre. So be, be, besides, you know, getting ready for all these different things, and, and actually I'm in the process now of reading the script, the first working script of, uh, of Weed Hacker Massacre, and, and I'm getting excited about it. And just, you know, fans' reactions and, just, uh, and little clips that are on, on, on TV, you know, or on uh, YouTube or, you know, on my, on my Facebook website. So I, I'm just so, uh, you know, involved or, you know, I'm almost a little bit overwhelmed with all the stuff that I've got coming up. Uh, oh, yeah. Because it's exciting. Of the yeah. And we may, I'm waiting to hear, we may be going to London, I think in July. And awesome. if we can work it out. It's just, oh, wow. you know, a lot of the, a lot of us are not in, you know, great physical health and even making a trip to Europe might be tough. So mm. I'm hoping that wherever we go, that the fans will come out and, you know, and, and get us while we're still able to talk in complete sentences. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you're, you you just you just hit eighty, and I mean, you're you're working on a new movie, <laughs> which yeah, is like super I, incredible. That's super inspiring. Well, my 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 dream was <laughs> my dream was to become the Colonel Sanders of horror. 
<laughs> I don't know. <laughs> oh man. Oh, and I and you're doing it. You're absolutely doing it. And I know um kind of tra to transition into Weed Hacker Massacre. I know Chase had some questions regarding the project and and, and we don't know how much you could really tell us about it because I know you're still kind of in early stages with it. Uh but Chase, uh, did you I think you had some questions about the upcoming film? Yeah, cuz um I wanted to say like in the storage locker um you had a a pretty significant background and foreground role right um where you're not to give too many spoilers for people that are listening and that haven't seen the storage locker uh but you have family members that are trying to essentially avenge a certain thing right um and that was your mm -hmm. first collaboration with Ray Spivy who I believe is the director on Weed Hacker Massacre how did that yeah. relationship start well, I, I I actually met Ray Spivey um, at at a, at, a, at the time a chiropractor's office, and 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 the fellow said, "Hey, I'd, I we be, we were friends," and he said, "I'd like you to meet uh, Ray Spivey, the director and whatnot." And so that I think that's how that happened. And Ray is just a wonderful guy, very bright guy, smart guy, and he and after we met, I think we had lunch together, and he said, "Alan." If you don't mind, I'd like to write a, a a part for you, a pivotal part in this movie that I'm making, which turned out to be Storage Locker, and that's that out now. That's out now, and so it's like away. I'm away from the screen for all these years, and slowly I turn, and they <laughs> pull me back. <laughs> and, and so after, after Storage Locker, you know, we 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 got we got together, and you know, I pitched them some some ideas uh, that kind of maybe a germination of, you know, what happened, you know, what happened to my character, you know, and he just took it in a different direction. And uh, it's, it's going to have a lot of different, different aspects of what's going on in today's, in today's world. And, you know, music festivals of the past and, 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 and the character, I think, and, and the killing machine of this character is also, you know, kind of somewhat unique. So I'm looking forward. Like I say, I just got the script. So, I'm just starting to read it, and I'm, I'm hoping it's going to be really a fun, a fun movie, and that fans of that genre will get a big kick out of it, and will will come to see it. And if not, I'll have to go into hiding, you know, <laughs> since it's Alan Spence, Weed Hacker Massacre, you know, for your dining and. <laughs> Well, I know uh, more than 30 people are going to be seeing it, and that's for sure. I oh, mean, absolutely. Yeah, 100%. We're, we're going to be there day one. Um, we're, we're super yeah. excited for it. Um, and I know you just mentioned that you haven't even read the screenplay yet. You just you just got it in your hand. But what's what's the yeah. most important or what's the most exciting part that like you're looking forward to with this project? Well, I think I think I'm, I think I play a sheriff in this movie and I might have a pivotal role a small but pivotal role in the, in this movie. So, and as a producer, I, I'm looking forward to being on set and I think uh, we'll be shooting the, you know, trailers for it in about a week. We'll actually start shooting the real, the real uh, film, I think next year, uh, okay. in 74. Cool. But, but the, I've seen some of the cast members and the leads and they're, they're good looking people and, and, and they're having a ball from what I hear. I was actually in Denver when they started shooting a couple of the scenes and Ray said everybody loved being on set they didn't want to leave you know so <laughs> it's all good I, like I say I'm I'm having the time of my life right now that is awesome did you have any I mean I, I like I said I know it's early on I mean is there anything else that you want to let us know about Weed Hacker Massacre that fans should look forward to I know it's early on and you know yeah. there's there's not a, yeah, a lot I you can tell gonna, us yeah. Yeah, but we're going to I think we're going to start a uh, a Kickstarter program and so uh, people will have a chance to uh you know if you're interested in in uh in, in donating to it and and if, uh or purchasing a lithograph uh that we have that's really really unique. And so there's a lot of ways of fans of Chainsaw or fans of us of me and uh, that want to help put this together cuz it's very expensive, very expensive to do a movie now. Oh, it's for unbelievable. Sure. Absolutely. I think it's it's definitely it, it's more I mean, we're living in a time where it's a little bit more accessible, I guess, to make movies with the technology, but it's still a very expensive thing to do. Um, right. And and so if, if we want we don't want to do CGI stuff. I mean, you know, 
people like that's why they like chainsaw because it's it's there. There's no CGI. What mm-hmm. you see is what you see. Absolutely. You know? So I, I think there's we have a I think a website weedhacker uh, massacre dot com. I think people can go to that and, and find out various ways that they can get involved, and uh, people can even uh, uh, be able to uh, be part of it if if uh, if they're able to donate a certain amount. So. I hope oh, that's uh, awesome. We'll, cool. we'll let people know as, as things develop. They can, they can go to the website or chainswithjerry.com or Facebook, uh, but weedhackermassacre.com. I think they'll be able to find out a lot more about the movie. Absolutely. And if you, you know, once you get that information, if you just want to kind of give it to us, we'll, we'll push the Kickstarter and, and you know, let people know. And I, I think, like you said, a lot of people that, you know, love Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, you know, they're going to be excited to 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 watch this film and, and be involved in the making of it, too. Like you said, you know, if we're able to donate and help, I think that's 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 yeah. an awesome experience yeah. on our end. Dynamite. Sure, sure. Looking forward to it. And and I'm having a great time with this uh, with the conversation. Did I is everybody had a chance to ask me questions is Will and Gabe? Everybody has a chance. I think yeah. so. Did you guys have other questions for Mr. Allen? No, I think I just wanted to go ahead and piggyback on uh, what you and Mr. Allen were talking about. I got my lithograph on the way. Um, I, you know, they're limited. So make sure if you want to get them, it's going to be, I'll throw this up there, Mr. Allen. I don't know if you can see the video feed, but I'm still holding on to this from the convention. It's your little uh, card with the QR code to the website. We'll put it in the description for the podcast. um, Where you can purchase a lithograph and um, support it in any way that you can. I've got mine on its way. So I'm a avid supporter of anything and everything that the Texas Chainsaw cast does, and especially yourself, Mr. Allen. And um, I'm sure I speak for all of us. And we're all going to give our heartfelt gratitude for taking the time out of your busy schedule and giving us nearly an hour of your day to talk all things chainsaw, um, weed hackers, storage lockers, eggshells and uh, stuff like that. So heartfelt gratitude for what you do to the community and coming on here. My pleasure, man. It's been a really, I've had a great time with you guys. It's been a lot of fun. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Allen. We appreciate it, sir. And uh, like I said, we're, we're looking forward to the new, new project and uh, just let us know how we can, you know, help support in any way we can. You got it. You got it. And we'll stay in touch. We'll stay in touch. Yes, sir. Thank you so much. Absolutely. All right. Thank- Thanks, Alan. Bye. Thanks, Alan. Bye-bye. All right, guys. So we just got off the little Q&A slash interview with the man, the myth, the legend, as we preface, Mr. Danziger. Um, What an absolute pleasure. Um, I never really thought that I'd have the opportunity to say I got to speak to somebody who um, is a horror icon to me in any capacity, any supporting role, anybody and everybody that's been on that Texas Chainsaw set and anything they've done since, since then is just gold in my eyes. And I've had the pleasure of meeting him and talking to him on three occasions and, uh, just shy of 30 days. And he is just so pleasant to talk to so well-spoken and just so much passion in every syllable, every verb that comes out of his mouth. There's just so much passion for the fan base that has been built around Texas Chainsaw. And he recognizes it as uh, such a classic, such an original, which they didn't necessarily expect to happen at that time as he prefaced in the interview it's just so much passion that you can feel through his voice so much thanks and yeah uh, how did you guys feel uh, about the the questions and the answers and everything else in between i well let let will go first because i uh, i think will and i were talking about it a little bit and i don't want to you know steal his thunder because uh, we were talking about the same thing but you go ahead will Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's all good. Um, yeah, I mean, to piggyback off of what you said, Chase, Gabe and I were talking about just you, you can you can tell when he talks, he just that that humble, the humbleness and the graciousness, it just comes through. You know, he's just a super genuine guy and just so grateful to to have the opportunity. I mean, even to sit down on a podcast with, you know, three dudes who, you know, he, he knows you, Chase, but he doesn't know Gabe and I for a hole in the wall, you know, and so for him to be so comfortable to just sit down and give us his time and, and and so passionately discuss, you know, not only Texas Chainsaw, but some of the other stuff that he's done and and give us a little bit of insight into his life and and how things came to be, how he got involved with that project and and the other projects that he's done um, in such a just wholesome, 
down to earth, you know, just, just, just super meaningful way. It was, it was, uh, really inspiring, uh, for me personally, you know, and I mentioned this during the, uh, during the interview, you know, to, to sit here and talk to somebody, which I have a VHS on my shelf, you know, two feet away with, with, you know, with his name on the, on the box, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's super cool, but yeah, he's just a super gracious guy. Um, he, he mentioned this a few times. You guys will probably remember. He said, you know, when we thanked him and, and you know, sh- told him how much we appreciate him, he said, well, it's it's reciprocated. You know, he mm-hmm. he, he said that a few times, you know, and, and he he seems to live his life and, and carry himself uh, in a way where, you know, he's been blessed um, with the opportunities that he's had. And and he, uh, he he's living every day, you know, making the most of that. You know, even at 80 years of age, he's he's still going and he's he's still super active and filled with energy. Um, and I was just grateful for the chance to sit here along you guys, alongside you guys, I should say, and uh, you know, pick his brain a little bit. Yeah, I think piggyback, piggybacking off what you said, well, I think it's just he's just super inspiring. I think like the the wealth of knowledge he has from you know just his experiences and with you know Texas Chainsaw Massacre, eggshells, all that stuff. Um, he, he he's just so humble about it. You know what I mean? Like going through stuff like that, you don't meet a lot of people that have been involved in the industry that are able to retain like that level of humility. Um, and also just being so, such an open book and talking about, you know, I think he had mentioned, he's like, yeah, I think, you know, there's some stuff I haven't talked about before. <laughs> um, yeah. Just being so open and, and, you know, letting us know about his experiences. And I, I think the most inspiring thing to me is just, you know, like you mentioned, well, he's 80 years old and he's now he's producing another movie. <laughs> Um, which is, it's just super inspiring. I think, you know, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, um, while, while, I mean, we, we, we delved into that a lot. Um, obviously it's a iconic masterpiece, but I think a a lot of the interview was just about Alan. And I think it was just, you know, us getting, you know, that wealth of knowledge and just being able to kind of, you know, process a lot of what he went through his experience and, uh, where he sees the industry today. Um, I'm, I'm just super grateful for the time he gave us and, um, just a, some, such a humble dude, mm. super humble dude. And I'm, I'm hoping with a weed hacker massacre that we're kind of able maybe to follow up with them when that movie comes out and, you know, process that with him. Cause it must be a different experience, you know, going from, you know, shooting those movies to 2023, trying to shoot a different movie. I'm sure it's going to be a different experience for him, but, um, we're excited for it. So, um, super grateful that he gave us uh, that time when he really didn't have to. No, absolutely. And then, uh, if you, anything we're probably going to say this a couple more times but definitely make sure if you're a fan of supporting people people that you look up to um we talked about it in the interview but it's weedhackermovie.com there's a limited amount of lithographs signed by mr allen himself and that directly funds this project and we implore you i have mine on the way and I, i i love supporting anything and everything i put my money where my mouth is and i'm more than willing to support mr danziger mr spivey the whole cast the whole crew um, and the coolest part is, you know, each time when you get the lithograph, uh, it enters you for a chance to have a potential small role in the movie. So, uh, <laughs> so if you really, really want to, um, you go out there, support the movie, support anything and everything, especially passion projects like this, right? Um, so Mr. Danziger giving us the time of day, uh, like we've said, uh, coming on here whenever we're still growing and stuff like that and being so excited to be a part of it is just monumental on both ends I feel like and he uh, like you were saying like um, Gabe if you want to go on about that I feel like that was just super awesome uh, I feel like that's something worth circling back to from the interview where he was on his motor uh, motor scooter and you know mm-hmm. we're blessed to have him with him uh, w- have him with us at this point because of what had happened and um uh, yeah um just super super, he's just full of energy man he's just full of energy and i think it's just you know i think i think it's important to like what you said i think it's important to support him because i know a lot of people in the reddit community discord community or just i mean general film community in general you know as a whole i think a lot of us have talked about how we want more independent cinema you know what i mean we want more independent projects we want want you know new movies coming out that we haven't seen before and you're, you know, supporting him. I think that you're, you're actually contributing to that happening. You know what I mean? Like we always talk about speaking with our wallets. Um, and I think this is a perfect op- opportunity to do that. So he, he, he's inspired me, man, a hundred percent because, um, you know, when he mentioned Texas chainsaw, the budget and, 
just, you know, how he didn't know it was going to turn out. You know what I mean? I know I, I've talked about it with you guys because I've, I've written a few screenplays and um, I've always thought about like, well, taking that leap and making a movie, what is that going to be like? And having him go through the same experiences I have, you know, going through school, master's degree and everything like that, and just jumping into the world of cinema, um, it was super endearing to, to hear. So um, I think that we all took that from Alan is just, you know, the, the inspiration behind what he's done and, and what he continues to do for the community. Um, he just reciprocates that, that uh, generosity right back to us. And it's, it's something that all, I think I, I speak for all of us that we're never going to forget. Mm. Yeah. I'll remember it forever. Absolutely. And it'll be out there for everybody to enjoy forever. Yeah. Uh, that's like you said, some things were, this is very special to him. There's some things that he doesn't feel like he's probably shared before that he wants people to listen to. So if you're curious about that, um, just share this with people, let them know. And yeah, Will, what are your thoughts anymore? Uh, I think I've said everything I need to say. You know, again, I'm just super thankful for the opportunity. And, you know, shout out to you, Chase, for setting this up for us. Like you said, absolutely we've told you before, we appreciate it. And, uh, you know, we hope that everybody listening gets something out of this. We hope this inspires you guys in some way to uh you know get out there and, and be creative and just you know go for it and with that i think uh i think we're gonna uh, i think we're gonna close out we're probably gonna we'll see if we can post um some of the links to like weed hacker massacre like any social media stuff like that that way if anybody listening is interested in in checking that out and supporting that project that's super important to us that you guys mm -hmm. you know look into that um it's essential you know uh gabe mentioned this you know supporting independent cinema and smaller, more independent movies, they are essential to the success of, uh, of the business, uh, but also just the, you know, perseverance of art, you know? Um, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll post those links in the description. And, uh, with that, uh, that will, uh, conclude the episode here. We appreciate you guys for listening. Stay tuned. Stay tuned, everybody. Thank you for checking this out. This is a heartfelt episode of Passion Project. Thank you, everybody, that's been supporting us along the way. This is a lot bigger than we really thought it could be, so this wouldn't be possible without our listeners. So thank you so much for all this uh, outpouring support. Thank you. Heartfelt. See you guys. We love you guys so much. Take it easy, guys. <laughs>